So welcome to session three. We will focus on integrated services coming together on the ground. Thank you. And you'll hear some examples of platforms and their unique contexts. And during this session, we'll discuss how to set up, implement, and scale integrated or coordinated services in the areas of health, education, nutrition, and social protection within existing platforms. We have three excellent presenters. And we'll start with Dr. Mushtaq Chowdhury, who is the Vice Chair of BRAC and a Professor of Population and Family Health at Columbia University. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Pamela. <clears throat> it's a real, real pleasure to be here today. And I congratulate uh, the forum for, for taking this uh, very important issue up. Uh, which has been neglected uh, too long. So I congratulate you for, for, for taking this, uh, this uh, uh, early childhood uh, agenda. Well, I, as I said, there, I, I, I come from Bangladesh. I work for, a, for an NGO called BRAC. BRAC is a large NGO, of course. And uh, so what I'm going to do today is to really uh, share with you some early ex experience, a very small experience on, on our uh, early childhood development. Uh, uh, Bangladesh has done quite well uh, in recent times, uh, and the Lancet uh, magazine recently published a series on Bangladesh, and they credited uh, the improvements to uh, different actors, including NGOs, and BRAC was mentioned as one of them. Uh, BRAC is large, as I said, that uh, we, we, we have about 120,000 staff uh, working in, uh, in uh, reaching about 135 million population. Uh, uh, but 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 the, in in implementing BRAC programs, we we use different um, uh, 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 platforms. So platforms would in, include things like uh, a village organization. Uh, so when we start in a uh, village, we uh, uh, set up a village organization of of women uh, uh, through which the micro credit is provided and women's empowerment is done. Uh, then, then we also train uh, community health workers. So, so there are about 100,000 community health workers working in Bangladesh. Then we also have schools. Uh, we, we run uh, uh, thousands of primary and pre-primary schools. Uh, also uh, uh, different uh, adolescent clubs. And also we have a uh, university called Breck University. Okay, uh, so, so uh, uh, I wanted to start by sh uh, sharing with you how we uh, use the, uh, these platforms to, uh, to implement a large program on MNCH. Uh, uh, through this program, we were working in 14 districts covering 25 million population in the rural areas and also 7 million uh, slum population in the urban areas. We, 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 we started the program by, by, by um, uh, uh, using the... Uh, community health workers as a, uh, as a platform, and also the village organization as a way of empowerment. And then we introduced uh, uh, things like uh, services uh, uh, at the community, including uh, the uh, delivery center for the women to deliver at, at, uh, uh, at the center, which also required us to uh, 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 develop a timely referral system for emergency cases. And that also required us to, uh, uh, to connect with the uh, 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 government and private uh, uh, health facilities. Uh, so uh, these, are the, these are the data from the program. It, it shows that uh, uh, there has been uh, large improvements in, in maternal uh, mortality, for example, but, but there hasn't been much improvement in neonatal health. Uh, and this is quite consistent with the national data that, 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 that we have. Now, uh, uh, coming to the ECD program, uh, uh, BRAC has been doing uh, uh, the ECD program in, in uh, bits and pieces for a long time. So, so, uh, so, for example, in our previous program, we had programs on breastfeeding, we had a, a, a live and Thai program, which, 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 which tried to work with the uh, uh, infant and young, young children. Uh, feeding we also had a kangaroo mother care project. <coughs> and also we had uh, uh, 
hand washing as, and, and, and also the preschools. Uh, uh, so so uh, about five years ago, we started thinking about uh, how, how do we really integrate more of the uh, early childhood things into our programs. And we thought that it's, it's very important to, to understand the uh, 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 theoretical, theoretical aspect of that. So we work with the Columbia University and we, at Brack University we have started a master's program on our early childhood development. So that helped us to understand more about, uh, about the early childhood. And then we uh, introduced several new things in our programs. So which included like uh, parenting education, also this stimulation as a, as a, uh, as a way for, 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 for early, early childhood development, and also uh, mental health, including uh, psychosocial counseling. <clears throat> we also set up different uh, things like uh, black corners in the village, and also uh, we are uh, 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 sort of developing uh, uh, different tools for monitoring the program. Uh, so this one shows very similar to what we uh, heard about Chile yesterday. And uh, this one uh, 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 has, has two aspects. One is uh, for under three, and, and the other one is for three and, uh, uh, three and above. And uh, uh, in under three, we are um, uh, trying to integrate the different um, uh, early childhood things uh, with, the, with the nutrition and, and, uh, and health. But, but in the, in the uh, three plus thing, we are trying to coordinate with the education program so that when, 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 the, when, the, when the work of the health program is finished or, or, or lessened, then the education program comes in and uh, 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 takes it over. <coughs> Excuse me. So this program, <coughs> uh, uh, we, we started early last year, and uh, we are in the first uh, uh, phase of the pilot, which is covering about 45,000 children. And based on the, on the early experience, we have also started scaling it up. Uh, so, 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 uh, so for the next two years, we will be scaling it, scaling it up to about 200,000 children. Uh, uh, so, so, and this one also has several of the uh, nutrition aspects which, which has been um, mentioned here. I don't want to go into the details of that. Uh, so what, what has been achieved so far? <coughs> uh, over the years since it started last year, uh, so we, we have been able to uh, counsel uh, several of the pregnant women uh, uh, on, on health, nutrition, and ECD. Uh, 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 we have been able to really achieve uh, 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 age-appropriate gross motor development for uh, about 90% of the children that we have reached. Uh, we, we have, uh, most of the children we have, we have uh, reached have actually participated in the, in the black corners that we have set up. Uh, we have found that, uh, that uh, the, uh, uh, the children who have been brought under that are more confident. Uh, 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 they can sing rhymes and songs and, and can speak in front of others. Uh, uh, we, we have seen that they uh, uh, wear sandals in and outside the home. <clears throat> and also we have seen that the mothers have learned uh, hand washing with soap and, 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 and brushing. Uh, with respect to the cost of this program, uh, it seems that uh, for the pilot, the total cost comes to about $40. <clears throat> and, uh, and out of that, black contribution is about $30, and the community is providing about $10 more. Uh, 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 that's for the children under three years of age. For the three to five years, it's, it's a little more expensive because you have to set up schools and so on. Uh, so, this, so the cost, uh, cost is a little higher than that. Uh, but, but in the scale-up program, when we have scaled up, the, uh, the cost has actually gone down, uh, which, is, which, which, which is the economy of scale. Uh, so so the, uh, 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 the, uh, the total cost is much less than uh, what it was in the uh, 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 pilot phase. <coughs> so uh, uh, this cost is the total cost for the, for the program. If we, if, we, uh, if we only consider the, the additional cost for the ECD part of that, then it will be much less than what it is here. <coughs> Finally, some of the recommendations. Uh, we think that there is not much awareness about ECD <coughs> among the stakeholders. So we, we feel that more of these ECD experiments should be uh, started in different settings. 
uh, and what, what, whatever experience we have, we feel that such programs should be scaled up to reach as many children as possible. Uh, we feel that we need to develop monitoring tools uh, because we feel that the, the tools that we have are not very uh, user friendly. Uh, and uh, also we need to develop research methods to measure the impacts of these on the, on the, on the early childhood development. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll move on to our second speaker with Dr. Zolfi Buta of Sick Kids Center in Toronto and the Center for Excellence of, for Women in Child Health at Aga Khan University. Yeah, I'm gonna try and do this in 10. Okay. So unfortunately, Aisha couldn't be here to present this herself, so I'm presenting this on, on, on her behalf and the team that undertook this work in Pakistan. So let me start by just indicating to you how diverse and challenging Pakistan is. If you look at various measures of multidimensional poverty index by, by districts, you can get a sense that the country is not only diverse, but also faces huge challenges in terms of both infant mortality and many elements that go into the estimation of MDPI. So there are parts of the country where living standards may be comparable to what you have in the West, and there are others where conditions are comparable to Sub-Saharan Africa. The importance of knowing this is that there is a fairly close relationship with not only just this distribution pattern, but also health services availability and access. So if you take the distribution of skilled birth attendance as a measure, you will find that in many parts of the country, this is really quite uh, low in terms of access reaching only about 10 or 20 percent of the population. And you see this for a range of other dimensions, such as, for example, access to children with respiratory infections, particularly pneumonia, and you find that the clustering of children who have appropriate access is largely around the areas where uh, you have uh, uh, higher human development indices. Uh, and the same with the distribution of nutrition as a risk factor for adverse outcomes. So I'm deliberately showing you this graphic to make the case as to why it is so important to integrate nutrition within health and developmental interventions in Pakistan and the reason for the government moving into a, into a program that could reach the poor in remote parts of the country. The program that I'm talking about is the Lady Health Workers Program. It's, it was one of the first community health workers program developed in the public sector in 1994, started off with a relatively low number of, of health workers, which by 2011 had reached about 100,000. And if you look at the distribution of these health workers in contrast to other cadres of workers, you will see that in contrast to physicians, uh, the number has kind of plateaued over the last few years to around 100,000 figure. And they are largely distributed in rural populations. Physicians, we have a plenty, but they're mostly clustered and concentrated in urban populations. What do these lady health workers do? They have largely a preventive and promotive role. They were principally put in place as primary care workers for family planning, promotion, antenatal care uh, provision, and some commodities, health education, and principally for referral of very ill children and, and women. They do not in general, provide curative services beyond oral rehydration and maybe simplified antibiotic therapy for respiratory infections. So the role is primarily supportive. So the idea here was to enhance the quality of nutrition services that these public sector health workers provide. And that was largely through strengthening of both the commodity provision as well as the education part of this, particularly in the early part of infancy, and also improving the use of commodities within this program, such as micronutrient powders being distributed by these health workers. There was a lot of interest expressed at the time when we conceptualized this study on also integrating some <coughs> early child development interventions, and particularly those that related to the care for development package that was being developed by UNICEF and WHO in close coordination. This project, when it was conceptualized, very few people know this, was principally discussed between me, UNICEF, and WHO in the cafeteria of uh, WHO headquarters in Geneva and written on the back of 
in napkin. And that's how this project came about as a, as a two by two uh, cluster randomized trial. So the idea here was to look at the adaptation of the care for child development package and to look at its focus on the first uh, 24 months of life, by and large, uh, using public sector health workers to organize the interventions to be layered on top of their regular activities. So remember, this is a public sector program. So what was designed here was to integrate these activities into a public sector program. It took us about a year and a half to get the permissions and to get the program on board, to develop the job aids and also the tools for data collection. And a cluster randomized trial was done, which principally had these lady health workers work with lady health worker supervisors. And the additional thing that we put in place within this project was the ECD facilitators. So these were not part of the government program. These were additional individuals who were embedded within the program to handhold these health workers and provide some ongoing support and, and, uh, uh, and provision of feedback. And the idea here was to work with both the mother and the child as a dyad throughout the course of the project. Now, I'm not going to go through the project in detail except to say that both in terms of provision of individual counseling, that the lady health workers were also encouraged as part of this project to undertake group counseling work. So the idea here was to also maximize their reach by reaching a larger number of individuals in the project. You can read the paper for the details. This was a cluster RCT, uh, tw about 20 clusters in each group, a two by two factorial design, and altogether close to around um, about 1,200 kids were followed up till 24 months of age with relatively low attrition. The overall mortality rates in the various categories are also available and are comparable with the general under five mortality for this district. Now I'm gonna show you key findings and the key finding from this trial was a pretty significant and notable impact on developmental outcomes. So this is one measure. There were several measures used in the trial. This is the Bailey's score at two years of age. And if you look at the impact estimations in the ECD exposure groups, both the ones which had ECD alone or the ECD and nutrition together, uh, you see a significant impact on cognition, language, motor behavior, and less so on socio-emotional factors. And this was significantly better than the enhanced nutrition intervention alone. The effect sizes are also summarized in this paper and they were generally pretty impressive. And you would see that there was no additive benefit in this two by two trial of, in, of adding ECD to the enhanced nutrition group in terms of developmental outcomes. That was a bit of a surprise because we expected intuitively that that group would do the best, uh, but it didn't in terms of its overall impact in comparison with the ECD group alone. There was evidence of integrated delivery, and if you look at a range of process indicators, both in terms of receipt of commodities, in terms of uh, mothers who had been provided counseling, both for breastfeeding and continued breastfeeding and complementary feeding, overall the nutrition intervention group appeared to do well but also the ECD group did comparably well. So there wasn't a, a clear benefit within the nutrition group alone of, uh, of integrated delivery of these interventions, but all were much better than the control clusters. The families loved it. From the qualitative data available, the families really liked the interaction with the lady health workers, both within the group one-to-one -one contact as well as individual visits. And you could see that by satisfaction ratings across a standardized set of measures over the course of the study. Now, there wasn't a clear impact on dietary diversity. If you see at different time points, 12, 18, 24 months, the diets did improve over time, but there was not a huge difference between the nutrition clusters and the child development clusters in comparison with controls. And that was largely because this was a rural and a relatively food insecure population where no additional food supplements were provided. And we also did not find a significant impact on stunting. There was some difference between the groups for linear growth, but no significant impact on stunting. So this was a complex project, and I'm going to summarize in the last few slides as to what exactly happened here and what did the lady health workers really see in terms of, 
of uh, determinants of their practice. So three things. Supervision made a difference. Experiential learning made a difference. And there were other factors that affected their performance negatively, such as they're being utilized in other activities, such as the polio program, and they're having to be absent from that area. So to conclude, there are many learnings from this project of trying to layer ECD within a public sector program. Firstly, the introduction of new interventions is not a simple thing of just walking in through the door to say, you do this. You have to really negotiate this with both the program people and also the health worker supervisors. And you will need to, as we did in this project, provide some embedded support, as we had to do with ECD facilitators who were able to provide demonstration, coach, coaching, and feedback. Quality mattered, and it improved over time as people got better in terms of doing this. But this required a fair amount of input and time uh, uh, contribution with master trainers who needed to be part of this project. We found that mixed methods of delivery were important. And although one-to-one -one counseling is what lady health workers generally do, the group counseling that was tried, which is what we have done with our perinatal projects, was also extremely popular and effective in terms of reaching people. Home visits were effective uh, in terms of both problem solving and observation of behavior. And it also required the development of a curriculum alongside with this project that needed to be sold and, and, and pr the public sector program brought on board. Lastly, I do want to talk about counterfactuals and I'll take just a minute for this. Can I go to the national program today and on the basis of this large district-based project say, do this? The answer is no, because we need to step back and see to a certain extent what are the questions that the program people will ask and have asked. The first is really the time commitment. So these are public sector primary care workers whose principal charge is to reduce mortality and to provide child survival interventions. Now, therefore, anything that you do has to have a time com component to it clearly attributed to their tasks. Secondly, the questions around what will be the impact on their core functions. So as you will note from the paper, if you've read, there was no reduction in mortality. And if anything, there was some counterfactual uh, counterintuitive trends, uh, which does suggest that as we scale up these programs, we've got to make sure that the core function of these public sector workers, which is largely in high mortality areas, to make sure that life-saving interventions are delivered are not compromised. I'm pretty confident they wouldn't be, but we need to prove that and show that to the program people as these programs are scaled up. Costs are an issue. We had to put people in place, extra people, provide support, and as you take this forward, this is not an insignificant part of their activities. And lastly, most importantly, in my opinion, and I'm reflecting to the first presentation of the day today, that it is extremely important to think out of the box and out of the health sector here, irrespective of what is the service delivery pattern, whether it's home visits or group counseling. We did not see an impact on nutrition because these health workers had no link with the nutrition-sensitive sectors. They couldn't do anything for food insecurity. They couldn't do anything for wash. They couldn't do anything for agriculture or social protection because they're not linked to those programs. And therefore, a heavy investment in this has got to take into account that maybe that's a role where health workers and non-health workers have to work in tandem or we perhaps need to find a modality of delivery which brings a multi-sectoral worker or intersectoral worker together at district level. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, and we'll now have our final speaker, Dr. Angela Diaz, who is the James C. and James W. Professor, I'm sorry, Jean C. and James W. Crystal Professor of Pediatrics and Preventative Medicine at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City, and she will take us a little further down the lifespan to adolescent health. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here. I was asked to um, describe a program that I've run in New York City called Mount Sinai Adolescent Health Center. And I was asked to describe the program because we serve vulnerable populations, because it's integrated at many levels, 
and also because it's um, relatively low cost for U.S. standards. I'm going to start by describing the population. We serve over 11,000 young people every year, ages 10 to 24. And um, we cater to poor youth that do not have health insurance because we know um, they do not have access to health care. In the U.S., you have to have health insurance or money to pay for your health care. Um, within that, so 98% of them are poor. And in New York City, usually class goes with race. So 92% are youth of color, African-American and Latinos. Within that, there is tremendous heterogeneity. Some of them have loving homes, going to school, aspiring to go to college or getting meaning for work. Some of them are in foster care because they were abused. Some are homeless. Some are being sex trafficked. Some are refugees. So tremendous heterogeneity. We serve them in what we call an adolescent-friendly services or team-friendly services. And basically what we do is that we take the adolescent perspective, we take their voice. What is it that they want? What is it that they need? What is going to help them come and avail themselves of those services? And we use that in the design and execution of the program. We really try to make the program very accessible, geographically, financially, just very easy for the teenagers to be able to come and use it. It's a place that feels safe, and some youth say this is the first time that they feel safe because many of them have been traumatized and exposed to uh, violence and other type of thing. We try to have a program without stigma. So we don't call it a family planning clinic or HIV clinic or substance abuse clinic. It's a teen center, an adolescent health center. Um, we love parents and family involvement, but if the young person needs confidentiality, we will serve them confidentially. Um, it's very adolescent, it's youth specific, so age 10 to 24. So we see children from birth, but they are the children of that age group. We do family therapy, but it's about a young person uh, 10 to 24. Um, the place is really easy for them to navigate and use and also, um, we work with them in a way that is developmentally appropriate. They are not adults. They do not think like adults. They do not have the experience of adults. So we work with them in a very adolescent-specific way. And with young people, you either love them or you stay away from them. So we try to find staff that love that age group and want to work with that age group. And it's really about relationship. It's we want them to feel loved respected, not judged, connected, and in that context, we do all the work that we um, need to do. The program is, now I'm going to talk about integration. The program is integrated in a number of ways. It's integrated like the clinical service is integrated with the uh, training, with the research, with the advocacy and policies. That, that's one level of integration. Another level is through the continuum of uh, wellness, promotion, health promotion, prevention, risk reduction, primary care, secondary care, and tertiary care. And that all is sort of in a closed loop. And another um, level of integration yet is this middle piece where primary care, sexual and reproductive health, behavioral and mental health, dental and optical are integrated. So it's really taking care of the entire person, not just pieces of a person. And I want to highlight a few of the specialized services because some of the young people are may need additional support. And those are young people that use substance. Uh, those who are gay, lesbian, transgender youth. Young people who have been the victim of violence, incest, sexual abuse, rape, uh, teen dating violence, domestic violence. Young people who are parents. And we take care of, the, um, for the teen parents, we see the teenage parents and their children together the same day. We provide services to both to make sure and hopefully prevent the next pregnancy. Make sure the, new, the, the, the child the, um, of the teenagers is really developing properly and really have an opportunity to grow up healthy and get uh, evaluated properly. And um, we also have 
um, young people with HIV. We are a major referral center for young people with HIV and um, transgender youth. And we have legal services. We have lawyers that also work within the program to help the young people with either civil or criminal cases. And we are very involved with the community. In three high schools, we have um, full-time um, services, full-time clinics. In other schools, we go and do health education. We train young people to be leaders and work with other youth, both in our program, through our New York City schools, and we also walk the streets. We go to parks, to arcades, to nightclub, to try to engage young people and provide support um, to them. This um, is a map of New York City, for those of you that had not been there. And um, where the cross is, that's where our program is. And this just shows that if you build the program in a way that young people can use it, they will come. So they travel very long distance. Uh, they, we allow them to come from other states. Sometimes they come fi from five hours away to make sure that they get what they need. And also, the other thing that you need to make sure is that there is a way for them to get to the site. For example, our, our program is we are close to the subways, we are close to the buses, so it's easier for them to come uh, when they travel. Um, we do research within this context. This is just to give you a flavor of some of the research. I'm myself very interested in, in, in uh, child maltreatment. Um, so I, li I like to identify the adolescents that have a history of um, physical abuse, sexual abuse, because often these things are taboos and people don't talk about it. And by helping identify, then you can provide intervention and the person can heal and do much better. The Quick Start is a um, research that we did with Columbia University, where we actually then came with a recommendation for birth control pills to be given to people on the day of the service. Prior to that, we used to say, start your birth control pills the Sunday after your next period. And that was very confusing uh, to them. They forgot, and by the time they came back, they were pregnant. So this, that research helped actually change the practice in, of that. We do a lot of work around human papillomavirus and the vaccine and other sexual, sexually transmitted infection. And we are right now being evaluated by an external group in preparation to go to scale. And we are also writing a blueprint and we hire a journalist and researchers to work on that so that it's easy for people to, um, to understand. Um, the program is very cost effective. We spend less than $1,000 per youth per year in the US. That is like the cost of an emergency room visit. It's less than one third what people spend for a traditional biomedical program. Extremely, extremely cost effective. Also the outcomes, our youth have lower teen pregnancy rates than other youth um, in New York City, New York State, and the country. Extremely, extremely low teen pregnancy rates. Um, the one that have sexual intermittent infection like chlamydia, 100% treatment. And uh, so we prevent the, the uh, spread of sexually transmitted infections. They also have lower emergency room visits, and they are much more likely to stay in school. In the U.S., poor youth, African-American and Latino, about 30 to 40% of them drop out of school. Our youth, 90% stay in school. And just in closing, these are, um, you know, we, um, some recommendations. We are, we are trying to create the evidence and the science to then um, move forward. But you know, we just feel that these integrated services without barriers are easier for the youth to utilize, that there need to be research comparing different approaches of serving youth and see what, which one are more effective about the um, integration of public health and primary care. And I hope that someday every country will have a policy on youth that is broad and includes how to best serve them and the uh, healthcare financing to doing that. Thank you.
minutes, I'm going to invite the panel up to the uh, table for some discussion, and we'll take your questions from there. Okay, so we had a chance to hear uh, about three programs, starting with BRAC, building ECD interventions into nutrition and health, and then needing to actually coordinate the transition to these programs being based in education for kids once they reach the age of three. So perhaps we can hear a little bit more about some of the lessons in coordination. And you made a wonderful point about the cost effectiveness for the scale up, and maybe we can hear a bit more about sustainability um, as, as the scale up continues. We then heard about a wonderful cluster randomized clinical trial of lady health workers and the integration of nutrition and child stimulation on, to the, this platform of lady healthcare workers. Um, we'll come back to some questions about that. I'm particularly interested in the idea of the mentors and how that, these were introduced in the context of the study, but what are your thoughts about sustainability of that particular kind of um, aid? in this context. And finally, we heard about a comprehensive and set of comprehensive and coordinated service for very vulnerable adolescents in a large urban area in North America with services being integrated across primary care, sexual health, and mental health. I think a, with clear cost effectiveness and cost savings, I think one of the questions here is in this high resource context, what are the options for scaling up say, across New York City and beyond, and how, how was the program thought about that? So I want to begin to, um, I want to let our panelists think about those questions and respond. I also want to encourage our online visitors and attendees to send in your questions, and someone will instruct me on how to, uh, <laughs> how to get your, word, your voice heard as well. So maybe we'll just start with, uh, with Mushtaq, and can you tell us a bit about the this coordination as you as the kids are move, moving from one platform to the next. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> well, I mean, as uh, the, it starts with health and nutrition, and then and then uh, it continues for th uh, uh, three years, and after that, uh, the education comes in. But but uh, health and nutrition continues even after that as well. Uh, but with with a, a law touch kind of activity such as parental education and uh, and uh, nutrition education in the school uh, so so it has so far uh, worked very well uh, uh, because we are working in a small area still it is a kind of a pilot uh, so we have to see when we scale up really big what what happens uh, and uh, uh, now uh, now that the education program and the health program are two separate programs as i was telling uh, uh, this morning uh, i mean they are big on their own uh, so when when it becomes bigger uh, how that coordination will, will really work we have to see have to see so, so you asked a question about mentorship I and mean, as i mentioned i mean in the context of this particular trial the mentors or the facilitators were introduced in the and they are additional to the main program now uh, if we were to go forward with the government picking up this model for potentially integrating these interventions in the Lady Health Workers Program, uh, then you would have one of two options. Either the program would need to create those mentorships within existing staff, so some of the Lady Health Workers supervisors would need to be trained as master trainers, and the big question out there is value for money. I mean, what are we getting at the end of this? The big questions that people will ask are not only, you know, developmental uh, outcomes at a time point like 24 months, but does this increase uh, school readiness? Does this increase school enrollment? Does this increase uh, school performance? So, so those three things would be quite important to bring in resources which may not necessarily come from health. So one of, one of the things going into this project was that if it turned out that you required inputs from sectors outside of health, such as promoting food security, gender empowerment, issues that related to education, then perhaps we could utilize at the district level a wide range of people who are there, but not necessarily link those. So I think the, the project, to me, is a huge success in 
underscoring the feasibility of doing this. And now needs to move from a proof of principle of actually doing this in, uh, at this level to the next level of trying an approach which brings those additional sectors in. So in Pakistan right now, uh, nutrition has finally found a place outside of health. So it's gone to the Planning Commission, which then has the ability to bring in the additional sectors that I've talked about, which are very difficult to do from a health sector alone. So I'm personally very pleased with this, because what it does allow then is a development of a policy whereby nutrition can bring in sectors that relate to food security, that relate to issues of the environment, that also integrate, hopefully, water sanitation hygiene, because we can't address stunting entirely through nutrition. Just not possible. So it allows us to therefore also think through in terms of operational implementation of models such as the ones that I've shared with you through practical implementation at district level, bringing together a range of sectors. Now, whether that's done in an integrated framework or whether that's done in a combined framework is completely open to question. And I think at a district level, it could probably have more than one model of operation. And I will say with um, our program, uh, several things. One is, it's a very complex program and it's very large and sometimes people get overwhelmed just by the pure size of it. It's the largest adolescent specific program in the US. And I often say to people that if they want to adapt it or start thinking about replicating, just to think about the principles because this, part, this specific program began just like three people a few hours per week, but the principles were the same. So that's one thing. The other um, issue is that the financing mechanism, we don't have a sustainable financing mechanism right now. Every year we have to raise $10 million to see the 11,000 youth, and we begin at zero every year. We do it, and we raise the money. We don't charge the, the, the youth. Everything is free. We don't exchange money at all. We buy their medication. We give them the transportation. But it takes a lot of work. I basically am trained as a physician, but I spend my time raising money to be able to see this youth. So what we want to do is, as we complete the evaluation and we have the data, is to see if we can go to the US government and convince the policymakers as to how cost effective this is in terms of not just human lives, but the amount of money that is safe to those, um, you know, health care, the education, and then jobs, because these young people stay in school and can be trained, um, instead of putting them in prisons, because if they are doing well and healthy, they are less likely to uh, end up in the criminal justice system. So we want to then be able to create the argument to see if we, if we become um, with a sustainable funding mechanism. Because we have been doing this work for 47 years. You know, the, the research is showing that it's uh, effective. But people are not going to be able to do it unless they know how to sustain it and how to um, have the money. So to me, that's the main thing that we are working on. And once we have the blueprint and all the findings, then we are going to try to just go out and try to convince policymakers to do the right thing. Thank you. So let's open it up and start to get some questions. Hero. Thank you for a, a wonderful panel that really um, uh, ties well to the topic of the day. Um, so I was initially thinking this is a question for Mushtaq and uh, Zulfi, but I think it actually also applies to Angela's program as well. Um, so in the issues of scalability of um, a program like Care for Child Development uh, focused on parenting um, or other, you know, other parenting programs, particularly for the zero to three age range, there is this question around the capacity of a community health worker workforce versus alternatives. So um, in a project with Melissa Gladstone in Malawi, we're currently proposing to actually experimentally test the and compare two workforces, one of which would be the community health worker workforce in Malawi, which would involve a lot of this task shifting, a lot of questions about feasibility, but one that is a community mother training community mothers, like providing that kind of training and mentorship, but for, to a uh, community, uh, somewhat of an opinion leader or carefully selected community mother approach. And so I was wondering, um, for all three of you, whether you know of examples where the scale has been, um, scalability has been improved or increased while retaining quality, that's the kind of issue. Uh, um, by moving from something like a 
uh, a community health worker workforce to one that is um, just simply a community-based workforce. And I think in the U.S. context, this has been certainly tested be with the difference between, say, nurses and paraprofessionals in home visiting, or I, I just wonder in the adolescent health services as well, whether, um, and in parallel, might be kind of peer-led um, uh, services versus kind of a, a, a more ex expensive or, you know, professional kind of workforce. Thank you. Uh, well, there are two aspects to that. One is uh, about the community health workers, uh, the sustainability, and, and so on. Uh, the, the idea of community health workers actually come from China with the, with, with the uh, barefoot doctors. And there has been a huge number of experiments around the world on, on these. But unfortunately, most of these actually failed. Uh, and uh, and uh, if you look at uh, those who succeeded, what are the sort of critical elements there? Uh, there are two things that, uh, that has to be there. One is that there has to be some kind of incentive for them. Uh, because, uh, uh, because most of these community health workers are women are from the poor families. So, uh, and we expect them to uh, uh, donate their time for, for, for societal good uh, uh, improvement. Uh, but but uh, that doesn't always work. So you have to build some some some, uh, some kind of incentive with that. So what we have done in Bragg is that uh, uh, these community health workers are also part of the microfinance group. So 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 these community health workers also get loan from Bragg, which ensures their continuous involvement as as community health workers. So that's 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 one. Thing. The second aspect of about the sustainability of community health worker is that. Uh, they have to be linked to a health system, whatever weak the system is. Uh, so what has happened in the past is that the NGOs have trained community health workers, but have them uh, sort of uh, left them on, uh, on their own uh, without really uh, connecting them with, with anything. But, but, but here we, we, have, we, have, uh, we, we have a health system, uh, which, which, is, which is the government health system, and also the NGOs, the PRAC has its own. Uh, uh, so, so, so we meet the health workers every month. Uh, we, we, we bring them for a refresher's training. So this way, we keep a close uh, relationship with them. Uh, so so that's, that's how, I mean, it, it has helped us to really continue with this. And, and uh, we, uh, we now have about, uh, over, uh, over 100,000 workers. So that's, that's one thing. The second thing is, is about the sustainability, uh, which, which uh, I mean, we, we obviously want uh, a, a behavioral change. Uh, so, so in uh, in the 80s, we we taught every mother in Bangladesh about ORT uh, through the community health workers, and the idea was that uh, uh, once the mothers learn about it, they will be uh, uh, sort of is, uh, using it on their own. They, you don't have to teach them again. Uh, so we did a study uh, many years after the program finished, and we 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 spoke to the uh, uh, children of those mothers who have been taught. So, 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 and we found that all the children, 70% of the children, they remember how to, or, or say, what is the uh, treatment for diarrhea. So this means that the, the, the uh, education has been, has been transmitted down the generation. So in, in, in our uh, uh, idea, that's sustainability. Okay. So, so let, me, let me take this further. So on community health workers, there are now global reviews of the evidence of uh, factors associated with success or otherwise larger models. I'm not aware of a single community health worker program which has been able to successfully integrate early child development interventions within it at scale. So if that's the question, then the answer is pretty simple, straightforward. The Lady Health Workers Program was the first such experiment to generate objective evidence, and I very strongly encourage my friend Mushtaq to generate the evidence from the BRAC program, not as an afterthought, mm -hmm. but as a primary a priori design, actually, so we can build on that evidence. Three, four things important. Firstly, the health sector will always have limitations. And the biggest limitation of the health sector is their line reporting authority. So, so you know, health people, whether they are junior, mid-level, or even supervisors, almost never interact with the education sector, never interact with the social protection sector, and never interact with people who are engaged in uh, agriculture and food security. So there is immediately that limitation that your set of interventions become narrow around health only. 
So the moment you're dealing with early child development, you have to go beyond health. So I'll give you a simple example. If the objective of these exercises at population level are to bring community engagement, to be brokers for perhaps very, very young children, linkages with the preschool's education system, and then to improve their school entry and performance thereafter, then you have to have workers who interface with that platform. The example in Pakistan of trying to get community workers, not health workers, volunteers to do so within a school nutrition program uh, was with the Thwana school program about 15 years ago. And it bombed in some ways because it wasn't able to connect adequately with other sectors beyond the school. So I, I would say to you that we need to be a lot more imaginative in terms of how we use these community workers, increasingly a wide range of players, not just health workers, and link them with some of the objective outcomes that donors, funders, and policymakers are interested in. And that means that we have to go outside of the health work. And in terms of our program, we have a very interdisciplinary uh, uh, program, like social workers, psychologists, nutritionists, the physicians, all working together with the population. Uh, but we just began a new initiative that is really about health in the community. And it's about it's not about health care, it's about health and education and jobs and housing. And in that, we are actually um, just finished um, through with the Department of Health training and placing community health working in all the public housings. And I'm training the youth also to become community worker. And then we want to evaluate that. We don't, we don't, we obviously are just at the beginning of that one. What we think is very, very important, and what we want to do is to start from prenatal or even antenatal, and then follow, and as soon as a child is eligible for pre-K or for whatever, to make sure they get connected to that service. Mm. And we are working with education, we are working with child protection, we are working with housing, all the different systems in a given geography. And I'm hoping that that will really, um, you know, that we can learn a lot from that. The, the first step that we did with that is that we map this particular area. So we use the teenagers that we have, the peer, um, you know, our peer health educators, and they went by foot following a model from University of Chicago. So they went basically walking block by block to see what assets, every single thing in that community that we are going to be doing this project, whether it is a um, bodega, a gym, a school, a uh, child care, whatever. So we now have, we know everything in that particular community. And then the next step of that is to really do in-depth interview of the people that work in that site, because you may not know that there are five different types of services within that. And then we want to link that to the electronic medical record. So when we say to someone, you need this, you know, that's not enough for a patient. That's not enough for a person. So we will say you need this child care, and it's right here, and this is how you get it, and this is whether it's free or not. So we are doing all the mapping of all the assets in the community, and we're really looking forward to that and the evaluation of that. As we think, can, can I ask a question? As we think about bringing these services together on the ground, I think it's also really important to take into account the viewpoints of the families and the frontline workers who are providing those services. And Sophie, I thought you had some very interesting data where you asked the mothers, how did they like the services? And they liked, from what I could see, the ECD services, which are what seemed to have the greatest impact. Did you also ask uh, the workers, how they liked it, you know, did the workers like the fact that, that they were doing more now than just health, or did they find that more of a burden? Because I think that, that could tell us something. And Mushtaq, ha have you asked your workers and your families, how do they like it when the, service, when the services come together? And if you're a community health worker, do you like venturing from health into education? How, how do they feel about that? So I'm going to ask my speakers to give brief replies, and then maybe we'll take one more question. So I, I can be brief. I mean, so, so Gary, the way health workers would respond to something like by voting with their feet, because we don't pay their salaries, and, uh, and if they don't like it, they would drop out. So there were dropouts, 
from the health workers. I mean, that's reported in the paper. So there were lady health workers who found that the supervision, the level of oversight within the intervention uh, was a bit too much compared to their regular day job and what they had experienced before. So we did have attrition. It was a bit more in the ECD groups and certain clusters. Overall, it didn't reach proportions that would be alarming. And I think it's safe to say that in this long enough project, lady health workers stayed within the program because they had their hands held. So there wasn't any pushback overall, except for a few people perhaps who, you know, you can always find in a program. So uh, um, the, pro the program had therefore sufficient success in terms of skills development and handholding. Well, uh, in, in, in black and it's, it's only one year that we have been really doing it in a, in a, in a comprehensive way. Uh, and uh, we, we have been, obviously, I mean, through our uh, monitoring system, we always talk to, the, uh, 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 talk, uh, talk to the people, the beneficiaries for that. And there's a huge lot of enthusiasm that we are seeing. Uh, and, and, uh, and, the, and for example, these volunteer mothers who organize the, uh, uh, the mother session where the stimulation things, uh, techniques are, are being taught. Uh, uh, I mean, we haven't seen any, 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 any of the session uh, stopped or, 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 or uh, being canceled because, because there's so much of interest among, among the mothers to, to learn about that. So, so we, we are quite, quite um, uh, optimistic that, that, that uh, uh, this will have a huge, huge impact on, on, on early childhood. Another question? Yeah. I'm going back to scalability. <clears throat> um, one of the hardest things to do is to keep supervisors so that they are doing supervision and not having, I mean, that means the car has to be available. That means that they have to have protected time, per diems, whatever it is, to get them out there. And that's the first thing that tends to be lost when things go to scale. I'm wondering, when you, when you think about taking these things to scale, how can, what's your experience in other aspects on how you keep the supervisors protected and able to do their job and wanting to do their job? Because often they, they use it as excuses not to go out because they like sitting in the health, uh, health center sometimes. So I'm gonna ask one person to take that. Uh, yes, yes, well, well, I mean, we, we have scaled up many programs and uh, we, have, we have seen that, that uh, if you want to really scale up a program, uh, you have to plan for that. Uh, you have to have your logistics ready. You have to have your training facilities uh, uh, ready to uh, take, the, take, the, take the increased load. You have to have your research and evaluation also scaled up in order to address that. So un unless those are done, uh, then, then uh, we, we, we don't really go for uh, scaling up. And in 30 seconds, the final word goes to Zul. So I think one has to differentiate scaling up things that are already within a program and have evaluated at reasonable scale versus new things being added to a program. So one thing within community health workers is really for every new thing that you add on to their repertoire, you have to take something off of hand. So uh, we find that people are frequently using community health workers as a very convenient excuse for not doing things in the formal, well-trained part of the health system. The lady health workers in Pakistan were never designed to be there ad infinitum. They were there for a purpose, a defined period of time, supposed to be scaled off by 2015 so that you, know, you could move to availability of services. So to answer your question, uh, I think we find that scalability is largely a success when there is a very thoughtful assessment of everything within the health system from training to commodities to workload to supervision, supervision availability and all the elements that you have talked about. When you add things ad hoc and you have no regard whatsoever for what happens in 24 hours or when the government pulls health workers off and puts them in the polio program for 30 percent of their time, that's when things go south. So uh, all of that is fairly well recognized within evaluations of health workers. So would you join me in thanking our panel?
So you're all uh, free to have your break for about uh, a half hour now. Be back here at 3.30 for the last two sessions. We still want to collect some more reaction videos. We got some really amazing reaction videos during lunch, and we want to continue to do that. So we'll be asking you to, to provide those for us. Thank you. <laughs>